Um, this is a this is a project um, led by myself um, and David Knight, looking at the the Derwent Valley Mills um, World Heritage Site and thinking about landscape assessment and modelling. Um, Steve Malone is involved from Trenton Peak, but also Tom Coulthard from the University of Hull and Karen Hudson Edwards and um, David Kossoff from Birkbeck College, University of London. This project um, came out of a, um, a Historic England um, call for this better disaster planning and building resilience to for heritage. So, so this is, was the impetus initially. Um, well, this is this is where we sort of started from. You know, thinking about climate, environmental change, and the focus very much perhaps towards individual heritage assets. So, you know, this is Boscastle 2004, a uh, very dramatic and famous storm in the UK. Um, again, the seven floods of Tewkesbury in 2007. You know, people certainly knew where to build their monuments in the past rather than the new Bovis estates um, further down in the flood water. Um, uh, dealing with heritage when we're thinking about individual sites is difficult enough. Um, but how do you mitigate the effects of climate change when you're dealing with multiple sites and where the the integrity of all these multiple sites is, um, you know, influential in the actual um, final, well, the monuments themselves, you know, where you've got a, a multi-asset multi resource. Um, so that's where we're really coming from in terms of this work. And the Derwent Valley Mills World Heritage Site is an example of multiple assets we have to think about. Um, now, the Derwent Valley Mills is not an alone as a, as a World Heritage Site. Um, it's one of a series of industrial landscapes where the physical heritage is intimately linked to, um, you know, the, the, the physical landscape. The actual heritage is linked to the landscape. You know, there are a number. These are the World Heritage Sites, industrial World Heritage Sites, um, circled by the, by the red circles um, across um, um, England and into, into Scotland. Um, we're looking at the one in, in um, yellow, number four, the Derwent Valley Mills. But you can see everything from the uh, Devon Cornwall mining landscape. <coughs> Number 12 is Blenavon, uh, coal mining landscape. This is the um, Iron Bridge Gorge, Derwent Valley Mills, uh, Salt Air on the River Air textile site, and New Lanark again, a, a textile site. Um, all these sites have very steep catchments. Um, they exploit resources which are in those catchments. And one of the real paradoxes is that the natural assets that led to the location of these sites are some of the ones which are most sensitive to future climate change. So there's a real paradox, you know, they've got great locations, but, but now climate is changing, that's a real, real issue. Um, what's the aim of this paper? It's to outline a methodological approach we developed for the Derwent Valley Mills World Heritage Site to provide some, to, to look at how you manage <coughs> and assess these multiple assets. And to also think about the generic application of that approach. Um, some facts about the Derwent Valley Mills. This is the River Derwent. Matlock Bath is up there. Derby is down here. The Trent Valley runs across the bottom here. It's 24 kilometers of river valley. Um, within that valley floor, there are multiple assets. And we're not just thinking about textile mill complexes. Um, we're thinking about all the associated infrastructure associated with that. So workers, houses, um, schools, there was a lot of philanthropy associated with the Derwent Valley Mills, so there were parks laid out, all sorts of things. Um, the initial mill, uh, the silk mill, went in in 1720, um, and then there was a major building phase from 1770 to 1790, but you know that continued into the 19th century. So it's so it, it's, it spans a considerable period of time. Um, it also includes these major historic waterman, water management assets, weirs to you and me, basically. Uh, mechanisms for diverting the flow of the river into the mills to create the power for the textile industry. Um, the River Derwent is now heavily regulated. The last of the major reservoirs, Lady Bower Reservoir, which is off, a, off, the, off the map, was completed in 1943. I think the first reservoir was completed in about, completed in about 1912. Um, so it's now heavily regulated. But Daniel Defoe, when he did his tour of England in the 17th century, talked about a river of fury. So it gives you an idea of the power in the past of the Derwent. Now, another important point is, although the World Heritage Site is actually based on the textile mills and the textile industry in that area, if you go slightly outside that area into the tributary valleys, it's got an important historic metal mining history, principally lead and zinc in the Derwent, which means that the floodplains are heavily contaminated. Now, that's very important, and I'll come back to it in a moment. Just to give you a flavour of the assets, um, you know, this is massive mills, you can see mills, nice weir systems, these are, I think that's a grade two listed, 
um, nice horseshoe weir. Um, this is the silk mill. This this complex was was some of the first developed, the first developed in the valley, although not obviously that particular building. Um, this is important because there's a weir going across here next to the mill under the water framework directive, which is another thing which comes into the the mix. They put fish passages to, to help um, you know improve the quality of the river, which again infects affects potentially the integrity of the site. Um, why is mining important? Well, mining is very important because if you look at other empirical evidence from northern Britain, we know that during the Little Ice Age, essentially a lot of the rivers went from being single channeled to multi system braided channels. Now, the reason they did that was essentially because big floods started coming down the system during the Little Ice Age. The sediment got recontaminated across the floodplain. Mm. That killed the vegetation. The vegetation which held the banks together previously, um, you know. Um, the vegetation which held the banks together previously didn't regenerate and therefore when another big flood came down the system it caused much more damage so it was a real sort of threshold change in how the system operated so one of the premises we had was could this happen within the Derwent Valley could this happen in the World Heritage Site under climate change scenarios um, what do we do then well basically we had a project over a year which looked at the Derwent Valley, using a two-staged approach, was how we developed it. We looked at the valley over the last thousand years, because basically the last thousand years encompasses the two last most well-documented periods of climate change, the medieval warm period and the Little Ice Age. So we wanted to sort of know, use that as a as our basis for our empirical study, and then sort of say, well, you know, if we can work out what happened during those periods of climate change, then perhaps we can extrapolate forward and think about how, you know, future, how the system might respond to future climate change, particularly change in flood frequency and magnitude. <coughs> what sort of data sources do we use? Well, documentary cartographic evidence. We did a lot of landform mapping using LIDAR, paleo channels, terrace features. Um, landslips, mass movement. We had a look at the geochemistry of the valley floor. How contaminated is the contemporary valley floor? Um, and obviously, we took all the historic environmental assets for the, for the high medieval to, through to modern periods, you know, essentially the last thousand years, um, from the historic environment record. And Sam, Steve, incorporated all of these in the GIS, basically. Um, now, if you look at the early Ordnance Survey maps of the valley, um, it shows that although the, the river's you know, pretty sinuous over the last 130,000, 130, 130 years, it's not actually changed position a lot during that time period. So we regressed the maps back, looked for change, last 130 years, there's no real change. And that probably reflects the fact that you've got what we would you know, consider a lot of furniture in the valley floor. So you've got the major road, the A6, which goes up there. You've got the railway line. Um, you've got the canal. All these things are quite close to the river. They're keeping the river within its place. And also, you've got all the infrastructure associated with the mills. So you've got the weir systems. You've got the vetments. You've got quite a lot of armour in that valley floor, which is keeping it effectively very stable over the last 130 years. But if you take the LiDAR imagery for some of the lower parts of the valley floor where we have quite a lot of what we call accommodation space, where the river is free to sort of try and, try and move to be free, um, we can see, here's the modern river in blue, but you can see there's obviously very well developed paleo channel systems, there's a lot of ridge and, forest, ridge and swale within the valley floor, and there's a lot of evidence for migration of the river across its floodplain. And what's also quite interesting was, by looking at the LiDAR information, we picked up quite a lot of new um, archaeological records. And there was quite a, um, a concentration of newly identified areas, as, as well as some extant areas, of, of ridge and furrow. And what we started to notice was that that ridge and furrow has a discrete relationship to some of the, the channels within the valley floor. So, you know, the, the sort of take-home message from here is, Sometime pre-130 years ago, there's, there's quite a lot going on. There's quite a lot of activity within the valley floor. Um, so what we did was we obviously took the GIS, we took all the information, um, and we produced some spatial maps. You know, nothing particularly, um, you know, groundbreaking approach, but it's basically mapping the archaeology next to the landform record and the contemporary valley floor to sort of start looking at spatial relationships across the valley. 
But the second stage of our project, this is where Tom Coulfard from the University of Hull comes in, was we thought, well, can we actually go and, and actually predict what the river's going to do in the future, over the next sort of, you know, lifetime, if you like. Um, and we've effectively used Tom's Caesar List Flood model, which he developed as a, as a young PhD student and has been developing for the last 20 odd years. It has a number of key inputs, it has contemporary rainfall data, it has contemporary river flow data, so you, you, you get all those bits of information, topographic data derived from the LIDAR, uh, data on channel bank composition, because obviously that affects how erodible the sediments are, um, information on whether there are channel obstructions, because again, bridges, weirs, revetments, they all constrain flow, they all affect flow dynamics, and then also data from the, um, the Met Office, what they call the weather generator, which basically um, capped, predicts future precipitation patterns. So the model basically has a grid, a 20 meter grids, grid cells with all those parameters in. You run it using contemporary data to actually calibrate the model and then you look at how it relates to the contemporary river system and then you introduce the rainfall data, um, the future rainfall data into that model. And what you end up with is, a, is basically a, an index of sedimentation erosion with red being erosion um, yellow bleep being um, sedimentation, uh, sorry, blue, blue being um, red being more erosion, blue being less erosion, shall we say. Now, what's the use of that in that index? Well, you know, it doesn't, doesn't have, a, have perhaps a, a great deal of applicability when you look at it like that. But what you can do is start actually mapping it against, um, against the archaeological record. So this is um, basically red is erosion, um, you know, green is, is less erosion. And you can see there are certainly areas where you can start saying, well, okay, there's going to be reactivation of paleo channels. There's certainly going to be some areas where there's increased erosion. How does that relate to the archaeological record? And you can start building up patterns of where perhaps heritage managers and the World Heritage Site managers need to think about mitigation strategies over the next 30, 40 years. Okay, what are the key headlines from this? Well, Ordnance Survey maps for the last 100 and, you know, 130, 150,000 years don't really show that there's been a, a great deal of movement in the valley floor. The, the river's been constrained. We certainly know the lower part of the World Heritage Site um, it, um, experienced significant channel mobility prior to the 1820s, but after the development of the Ridge and Furrow. Now, you know, Ridge and Furrow is a very problematic thing to date. We all appreciate that. But if you sort of say... You know, medieval warm period, warmer climates, perhaps expansion onto the floodplain during the high Middle Ages. Little Ice Age comes along afterwards and, you know, basically deterioration on the valley floor. We certainly know that there were major floods which affected the valley during the Little Ice Age and that Neil MacDonald's work at Liverpool. Um, but regulation of the catchment has lessened that threat. We know that the floodplain is heavily contaminated, so therefore... Um, any disturbance of that system, and I'm thinking of things like Water Framework Directive particularly, um, could have significant implications. But also if tourism is used much more, um, if, if, if the valley is exploited much more for tourism under, you know, perhaps an ameliorating climate. Um, we certainly know, one of the things that came out of it was actually the upland peats have atmospheric metals deposited. Well, metals deposited through atmospheric processes. So the upland peats are actually jam-packed full of metals. And if there are changes in how you know dams are used in the future. Um, you know changes in management practice in the upland that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, we certainly know that there's hot spots where we need to think about change in the valley floor. What are the key messages? Well, individual heritage assets need to be thought about within a wider landscape context. And one of the points I would really make as, as somebody who, who's come from a geomorphology background is that landscape inheritance is incredibly important when thinking about mitigation and not just thinking about the archaeological sites themselves and the history of those sites. You know, Kaisu's example of isostatic change, you have to think about that and, you know, within, within the context of a longer term landscape history. Um, and the, the metal mine is a classic example, you know, it, it's part of a longer term history and it doesn't necessarily relate to the archaeology everybody's thinking about in terms of the World Heritage Site. Um, this study has also demonstrated the uh, value of linking empir empirical geomorphological data or geoarchaeological data with modelling approaches. Geomorphologists and geographers have been using landscape modelling for years and yet in our, you know, archaeologists don't seem to engage with those models, to use them to sort of try and um, 
you know, look at landscape. So I think that's a really important point. I think it's a really valuable example of collaboration between two disciplines, which is basically because I shared an office with Tom at one point. So, you know, it's serendipity, a lot of that. Um, provision of methodology. Well, you know, we want to try and use this and upscale this to sort of think about other world heritage sites. Can we apply it not just to the Derwent, but perhaps to other industrial world heritage sites? in the UK and across Europe, I would say. Mm. And the other point I would make is it's not just about World Heritage. We, just, we chose to do this um, work in a World Heritage site because, you know, there's going to be less argument about, well, is that archaeology important? Should you, you know, does it, does it really matter? If, at least if it's a World Heritage site, we can say that, you know, basic, based on the uh, inscription, you know, everyone's going to agree it's an important site. So that's why we'll, we'll apply it initially there. But we could apply it to a range of environments, landscapes and, and archaeology. Right, I shall leave it there. So thank you very much.